Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our community event, St. Luke's Lung Cancer Screening, It Could Save Your Life. My name is Leah, and I will be your host tonight. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to let you all know that I will be emailing everyone a link to a lung cancer screening survey. If your answers indicate that you might be eligible for lung cancer screening, a St. Luke's representative will be in touch with you. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Brian Adley. He is a respected pulmonologist here at St. Luke's. I'm Dr. Abley. I'm one of the pulmonary and critical care doctors here at St. Luke's, and we're going to talk about lung cancer screening. And uh, I have no conflicts of interest in what we have uh, to talk about today. Um, just some basic facts about lung cancer. Uh, it is the second most common cancer in both men and women. In the United States alone, 230,000 uh, people will be diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, this year. There is an increase in women being diagnosed with lung cancer than there are men, and that's typically due to the fact that more women picked up the smoking habit 20 years ago or so compared to men. Smoking is also uh, the leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. All, let's see, of all the deaths in the United States, 20% are related to smoking. Uh, some more staggering information here that uh, lung cancer uh, deaths are higher in number than breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer combined. Over you know, almost 2 million deaths a year are related to lung cancer. And in the U.S., for 2021, it's estimated that there'll be 130,000 deaths. If you add up all of the smokers in the United States right now, that would total 94 million people. 82% of all lung cancers are directly related to smoking. So the math of that is, uh, I, I couldn't do it. And I, I, I couldn't believe what that number would wind up being. And unfortunately, rarely symptoms are ever present uh, until it's an advanced stage of cancer. Some of our conversation tonight will be talking about uh, some statistics and uh, some medical terminology. We'll try to go through all of that information to help you have a good understanding of, you know, the cancer, how it presents, how we discover it, how we diagnose it, and uh, further management. We'll also talk about smoking cessation as part of that whole process. Uh, the first thing is that you know, again, can lung cancers are typically uh, found once they're advanced. 60% of them are at the metastatic stage, and the survival at that stage of lung cancer is only 20%. And if we were to look on the earlier stages of lung cancer, only one out of four lung cancers diagnosed are in the early stages, and the survival is much, much better at 80%. We in medicine would very much like to turn the tables on this and start diagnosing. Well, of course, we want people to not smoke, but if people are developing lung cancer, our goal is to diagnose it and catch it early to promote the survival rate of 80%. So, you know, we talk about all these numbers and statistics and 94 million Americans smoke and, you know, what what got us here? You know, why is it that we all know the, the risks of smoking and how bad it is, but there are people out there who spend a lot of money trying to convince you to smoke. And back in the 50s and 60s, they used Frank Sinatra trying to cater to men and talk about uh, man size satisfaction and big pleasure and uh, the Marlboro man trying to sell you an image that's related to smoking. Uh, not only uh, are men targeted by this, uh, but also um, people of color are, uh, are targeted with ads catering to them um, with the clever taglines. Also, after all, if smoking isn't a pleasure, why bother? Uh, cool ain't cold, Newport is. Um, women are also targeted. Uh, we have a, a woman with daughters and they all prefer lucky strikes 
We have a, I believe this is probably from the 70s. This is a professional woman uh, who is smoking a sophisticated cigarette. Um, and then pregnant women are also uh, told in some ways that they are craving the smooth taste of uh, Nico time cigarettes. And these are all kind of head scratching uh, ads uh, to be sure, but it's not just the public that are uh, targeted. Uh, healthcare is also uh, quite guilty of promoting cigarettes uh, way back when. So, you know, here's the Lucky Strike ad about 21,000 physicians saying that Lucky Strikes are less irritating. So that's a pretty high number of uh, doctors promoting smoking in general. Uh, and then, you know, if, if this is sort of, uh, you know, the counter argument for promoting camels. And uh, we also have a dentist down here uh, putting his voice into uh, smoking viceroys. Uh, and not only are healthcare workers uh, guilty of this, but also jolly old St. Nick. Uh, he's now promoting Paul Mall cigarettes uh, over, you know, camel straights or any other types of cigarettes to guard against that throat scratch. So there are, again, a lot of money trying to convince you to smoke. Some basic information about smoking. Uh, again, what leads to lung cancer, smoking cigarettes is obviously the highest uh, risk factor. Quitting smoking will lead to a reduction of your risk of getting cancer within five years. So the sooner you quit smoking, the better the benefit. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, secondhand smoke was found to lead or contribute to lung cancer. About 3% of all cancers are from secondhand smoke. Lung cancers are from secondhand smoke. That's been around again for about 20 years. Uh, asbestos uh, is a very common form called mesothelioma. Um, that's somewhat predominant. Well, that's kind of common in this area. There's other parts of the country that never see it. Uh, radon from basements, uh, diesel exhaust, other things like radiation therapy, which is uh, higher risk in smokers, chronic lung diseases or long-standing lung diseases, such as COPD and other rare forms of inflammatory lung diseases like ILD. Um, and if you've never heard that, that's good for you. Uh, other causes would be genetics, but again, very, very rare. It's important to talk about symptoms of lung cancer. Again, they show up late, but it's important to understand what the word nonspecific means. So if you have a person who has a cough and trouble breathing and coughing up blood, you know, we always, you know, just as people, we tend to think, oh, worst case, that's probably a cancer. Uh, in medicine, the leading cause of coughing up blood is actually a pneumonia. So by the meaning of nonspecific, there are many different things that could cause a cough or trouble breathing or chest pain or weight loss. It's the, you know, conversations that you should be having with your primary care doctor or your pulmonologist, if you have one, about your symptoms in light of smoking. And, you know, we will then kind of put the puzzle pieces together to create a risk profile of what you're presenting with to understand what's the cause of what's going on. And if we know that you're a smoker and we know how long you've been smoking, then the likelihood of cancer and that just kind of raises red flags. But again, these are nonspecific symptoms. The ways that we have over the past 50 years or so of trying to find or uncover lung cancer uh, are several things. Um, uh, sputum samples or spit samples uh, have been tried without any benefit. Blood markers of cancer uh, might be the new avenue for determining whether there's a cancer or not. Um, but currently, chest x-rays and CT scans, which we'll talk about at length here, are the primary drivers to identifying or uncovering cancers, uh, symptoms or not. So this is a standard uh, radiology room. Um, here is the plate that the uh, x-rays uh, collect on, and this is the um, delivery device and having a person stand in front of the plate 
with the x-ray beams going through their chest and then collecting again here will bring you a nice uh, chest x-ray. So this is a uh, picture perfect chest x-ray. I'll just kind of go through some of the simple findings. You know, I, I don't see it. One of the nice things about a chest x-ray is their symmetry. So whatever's here should be here. So we see some nice ribs, some blood vessels down the center here. We have the heart, uh, the diaphragm, and radiologists and pulmonologists and primary care doctors look at chest x-rays quite a quite a number of them a day. They get a good understanding that what's normal and what's abnormal. Um, another tool that we use, again, is the CT scan. I'm sorry, this is a little fuzzy. Uh, but basically, this is a high-definition X-ray. A person will lay here on the table, and that table will move in here. There's a spinning scanner in here. You'll hear a, like a whirring, and within three or four seconds, it can take a nice picture of your lungs, and then you're done. So this is kind of a cartoon of what that looks like. There's a X-ray beam here and the collector plate here, and it spins. They're called spiral CTs. Um, and this would be a representative picture of what a CAT scan looks like. And so, you know, depending on what the doctor orders, chest x-ray or a CAT scan, then you know, reviewing those are important. And what's normal and abnormal, again, these are blood vessels and airways, and this is your heart here. And this is basically normal looking lung tissue at one section. CAT scans go, if you can see up here, this is uh, a representation of what you would look like. and then these are cross-sectional cuts, that's what we call them, or slices at different parts of your uh, a person's chest going from head down to the stomach. And so this, again, is your heart and then normal sections of uh, CAT scans. So every now and then with a CAT scan, so say you have uh, hurt your shoulder and you want to get a chest X-ray, and lo and behold, they find something called a pulmonary nodule or a spot or a shadow, um, a bump. Those are several things that people will say that the doctor has told them about. You know, that, that we're talking specifically about pulmonary nodules. And, and we run into pulmonary nodules every day. And, you know, those tend to cause a concern. Are these precursors to cancer? Is this a cancer? And so that's an important word to understand and kind of we'll walk through what that means. And a pulmonary nodule is a mass, it's undefined, it's less than three millimeters in size, it's found incidentally, and you know, they're present in your lungs, but they don't normally cause symptoms. Um, you know, the way I try to describe this every day to patients is that you know, we're, our lungs are constantly in interacting with the, our environment. We're inhaling dust particles, debris, smoke, pollution, you know, if we're uh, sawdust, you know, spray paint, wh whatever our careers are or our hobbies uh, or our environments, you know, our lungs sometimes trap elements of what we've inhaled. And so there's many different reasons to have nodules. So we just take things a step at a time to figure out what's going on. Um, uh, good pictures of uh, nodules. This is, a, again, a CAT scan. You know, what's normal, what's abnormal, but through uh, years of training, uh, we'd be able to identify that this is a nodule and over here is a nodule and we'd have to describe them. And important things that we talk about is the diameter. So how how wide is this? What's the shape of it? It's smooth. Is it, you know, jagged? This one actually tugs. Again, this is a this is a fissure. This is a natural part of a lung where two pieces of lung meet. But there's a scar here, a, kind of a tugging, which might mean something, uh, but needs more investigation. Uh, other, another uh, CT scan with another nodule, you know, in, in medical training, this is called a positive arrow sign. So if you ever see this, that means that it, there's something here that's abnormal. So this is the abnormality. Again, it's smooth, it's rounded. Uh, one thing to note is this is the right side, this is the left side. So this is the left lower lobe of the lung. There's a, there's a nodule. And so what do we do with that information, that kind of thing? So just as a quick back out, background, CAT scans were kind of, I think they kind of came online in the 1990s. So maybe 30 years of CAT scans. And I read a statistic in a, a journal article a, a month or so ago that there are a million pulmonary nodules seen in the United States alone every year. 
So multiply that times 30 years. So there's been maybe 30 million pulmonary nodules that have gone across radiologists' desks over the past 30 years. So we've been able to collect a lot of data and we understand what we call the natural history of pulmonary nodules. And we don't go around sticking needles in every single one of these. We don't ignore them. There's something in between. And what we found is that nodules of various sizes grow. That, that would be the concerning thing, right? Is if they grow, we know how quickly we expect them to grow. So nodules over time will either shrink, stay the same size, or grow. It's the ones that grow again that we're worried about. And if you're a smoker, then that increases our concern about these nodules. So if we find a nodule kind of randomly in a patient, this group of radiologists, cardiothoracic surgeons, and pulmonologists, there may be some other groups in there, I apologize if I forget the groups, have come up with this Fleischner's criteria where we look at the size of the nodule, it's in metrics, I'm sorry, but this is always in metrics. So six millimeters, six to eight millimeters or greater than eight millimeters. Uh, so we measure them in these sizes and then the risk of the patient, is the patient a non-smoker basically or a smoker? And so we just follow this grid about when we should follow up a repeat CAT scan. So if you have an eight millimeter nodule in a heavy smoker, and they need they probably need a scan three months from now. So the concern is, will this grow in three months or not? Uh, waiting two months is not enough time, and waiting two years is probably too late. So the 30 million CAT scan nodules, CAT scan found nodules, informs us that that's the time to check. There's two types of nodules. I'll kind of just go through that in a little bit, but that's kind of the the basics of that. So what does lung cancer look like on a CAT scan and chest X-ray? Again, this is a normal chest X-ray. Uh, this large nodule here in the right upper lobe or right lungs, right upper lung zone uh, is suspicious for cancer given its size. Sometimes they hide, again, a positive arrow sign. Those aren't found on every radiologist chart, but then they put them there. This is the nodule hiding right here. Uh, other times, there's the red circle sign. Uh, that would be the nodule in this area. Um, CAT scan imaging also has those. So looking at a couple different CAT scans, this is the same kind of level. Again, there's symmetry. There's nothing here, but there's this giant rounded lesion nodule mass here that, that is concerning for cancer. Uh, and then we also talk about, you know, this doesn't look anything like this, but this may actually be, <clears throat> excuse me, a certain type of cancer, and that needs to be watched over time also. Uh, this is, again, rather fuzzy, but, you know, when they talk about cancer, I kind of think of the uh, the crab or, you know, the, the uh, what am I thinking of, the zodiac signs of cancer, it's a crab. So it's got this spiky image to it, sort of like the legs of a crab. Um, this is highly concerning for cancer. Um, this would warrant almost immediate evaluation. Uh, again, the positive arrow sign will tell us that too, but that's a concerning sign for a cancer. This is also a concerning sign for a cancer. This is sort of this ground glass appearance of a slow growing cancer. It's weird to say that, right? When you think cancer, you think an emergency, this needs to be looked at right away. They do, but some tend to grow slower than others. So it takes a lot of experience and conversations with your doctor and plenty of time to answer questions about what we're looking at and what's the risks and where should we go. So when we see something like this or you know, like this, sometimes if we don't, if we're not quite sure what this is, we'll go forward and do another study, and we call that a PET scan. So a PET scan, positive emission tomography. Um, you know, we like to use a lot of acronyms because that's too too long to write in our bad handwriting. So if this is a PET scan setup, so if we're worried about this mass and this patient, um, radiologists uh, and oncologists and other doctors have figured out that cancers consume a lot of resources. A very simple resource that cancers consume is sugar. So if we put a bunch of radioactive flags on a lot of 
sugar and give you an IV solution of that and let it circulate for a few hours, those radioactive flags should collect together and under a special scanner, we'd be able to identify them. So a PET scan is what we use to do that. So a PET scan is a combination of this sort of scan plus a CAT scan. And this area here, who we call lights up or becomes very yellow to white. So this is, again, this is, itself is highly concerning for cancer. This con confirms our suspicion that this needs to be you know, biopsied immediately sooner than later to figure out what's going on. Um, interestingly, uh, the brain in this picture, so this is the area of the lesion, uh, the brain lights up also. Uh, that doesn't mean that they have brain cancer. It means that the brain uses sugar also. So a PET scan does not work in the brain. You have to get a special scan called an MRI to see if there's cancer there. So just some background there. And then we talk about uh, how to diagnose the cancer after we have raised our suspicions of it. We have a bronchoscopy or endobronchial ultrasound bronchoscopy. Pulmonologists do those procedures. Uh, cardiothoracic surgeons will uh, also perform surgeries if necessary to remove uh, pieces of lung tissue or larger lymph nodes, and then interventional radiology. Uh, here at St. Luke's, we have two great uh, interventional radiologists who uh, will use CT guidance to identify the area and uh, place needles to uh, get some tissue samples uh, as an outpatient procedure. So all uh, have different uh, reasons to be done and uh, different outcomes and that sort of thing. Uh, so once we get a tissue diagnosis, there are two general types of cancer, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, it used to be enough to just call the two, and now with advances in chemotherapy, we have adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, and it's actually being broken down even further uh, with immunotherapy, which is beyond the scope of our discussion today. Um, some things about non-small cell lung cancers, it's important to stage cancers. So if you know anybody who's had cancers, they talk about well, what stage are they? And that has to do with the size of the tumor. Are there lymph nodes involved? And has it metastasized? So metastasized means it's gone to this original primary cancer has spread to other parts of the lung, to the brain, the adrenal glands, to bones, or the liver, and so on. We combine the T, the N, and the M to come up with staging of a cancer. So the tumor nodes and metastasis are important in A, figuring out or identifying how can we best treat this cancer, uh, B, can we improve survival, can we cure this, or uh, you know, and or the is the option a palliative approach where we can uh, promote quality of life once we recognize that maybe the quantity of life isn't as high as we had hoped. So again, early detection of cancer is the goal. We're talking about an 80% survival versus a 20% survival the sooner we are able to diagnose this cancer. This is a giant uh, chart. I, I don't mean to throw this giant thing at you and expect you to make any sense of it. Other than to show this is the T, N, and M, we break it down further. The T, we talk about the size of the tumor, and that helps us determine what stage the cancer is. The N is are there, where are lymph nodes, that matters. And then where are the metastases? So these small details build into another grid that help us determine the stage. What's the important part of staging? Then we talk about the survivability of a cancer. So the size of the cancer, the lymph nodes and the metastasis help determine, you know, how long a person can expect hopefully to live. This is, it's hard to describe this as a population. So, you know, 92% of everyone with stage 1A cancer will survive, but how does that translate to one person? It's a little bit harder than that, but uh, Suffice to say, the sooner we catch it, the, the better. So if we look at a lot of times we talk about lung cancer or cancers in general, we talk about five-year survival as one of the benchmarks. And so I, I totally drew this. It's a, it's a bit messy. I went to med school, not art school, uh, admittedly. So if this is five-year survival, 
and then uh, we talk about 50% survival. So anybody above here, the odds are higher that they'll survive. Most of these stages of cancer, purple and higher, are right here, stage 2B. So you have a population-wise 53% chance of surviving five years if we capture this cancer at this stage. If we're at stage 4B five years from now, uh, the chances of surviving are zero. So again, uh, just another, you know, hammer that away, you know, the sooner the better. Um, and then it's a little different with small cell lung cancer. We, we stage that a little bit differently. Uh, it's a very aggressive cancer. Typically 75% of small cell cancers have metastasized at the time of diagnosis. So that cancer doesn't quite match this. Um, and those are discussions down the road with your physician um, to figure out what options are available. So all of these things are all tied together to figure out what this study, uh, the, kind of the focus of what this uh, talk is about is this lung cancer and low dose uh, CT screening. So if we identify that CAT scans and chest X-rays are two ways to identify or to pick up or surveil you know, nodules in your lungs. And if that's the first step we do, then is one, does low dose, is low dose cancer uh, more successful than chest x-rays at reducing mortality in people who are high risk? So kind of teasing that sentence apart, does one test, the CAT scan, do better than the other test, the chest x-ray in reducing death among people who smoke? So what they did was they identified first who high-risk people are. So anyone between the ages of 55 and 74 who smoked a 30-pack year, who have a 30-pack year smoking history. So wait, that doesn't, I've never heard that before. So a 30-pack year smoker is a person who smoked a pack of cigarettes a day for 30 years or a person who smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for 15 years. So that's the equivalent, that's the same amount of smoke. Uh, also part of the high risk category is a group of people who either are current smokers who, or who have quit within the past 15 years and they have no signs of cancer. So this is the group of people we're studying and they were able to find 53,454 people. That is an amazingly high number of subjects to study. This is going to be very telling in terms of how accurate this report will be. Like this is a, you know, this isn't 10 people or 100 people or 1,000. This is 53,000 smokers. Uh, and so we're able to get a lot of good, accurate data from that. The study chose to use chest x-rays and low-dose CT scans. So a low-dose versus a high-dose in this setting means less radiation, but the same quality of imaging uh, in order to pick up these uh, early stages of cancer. They would take a picture or a CT scan or a chest x-ray at year zero, or you know, if we're going to start the study tomorrow, then we'll do a CT scan or chest X-ray on Friday, November 19th, 2021. Then we'll do one on November 19th, 2022, and then 2023. So that's how they did this. And again, more numbers and statistics, but what they found was in this column here, this is the number of nodules found by CT imaging. This is the number of nodules found by chest X-ray in the same year. So they found three times as many nodules uh, in the CT scans than they did in the chest X-rays. That was the same throughout. There's less down here than, than there are up here because they no longer counted these. So this is a new group of, of newly found nodules. Okay, so it seems pretty evident that the CAT scan is very good and it's better than finding the chest X-ray nodules. Okay, so now what? Well, so afterwards they they didn't just say okay well now we've collected some data let's leave the patients alone they said no now let's collect the data now let's see what that does about survival so they worked on diagnosing these you know, uh, let's see 13 17 18,000 people here and seven six thousand sixty five hundred people here 
And so they did follow-up imaging, they did biopsies and surgeries, the PET scans, those things that we talked about earlier. And in the uh, the low-dose CT group, they found 1,000 lung cancers. And in the chest X-ray group, they found 941 cancers. So what that translated into over time, they treated these patients for their lung cancer, they followed them over time, and and what they found was over time, of the low dose CT group, 356 people died. And in the chest X-ray group, 443 people died. So let's just kind of look at the uh, graphs to help kind of understand what all that is saying. So over eight years of time, they found this number of lung cancers. So the low dose CT found 1,100, what was it, 1,060 cancers and the chest x-ray found 941. So more cancers in the low dose CT. So now here's the lung cancer deaths. They had only 300 or so, 356 deaths out of 1,000. And here they had 443 deaths out of a lower 900. So they decreased the mortality by 20%. So they saved lives by using the low dose CT scan versus the chest x-ray. Okay, now yeah, there's numbers and pictures. The pictures are always helpful. So how big is this gap? This gap is significant. This is a 20% change in outcomes. That is a big difference. Think of all the people that that has you know, impacted out of 53,000 uh, total. So again, a 20% decrease in mortality. They needed to screen 300 people roughly to save one person's life from uh, lung cancer. That's a fairly good amount of people to see. So mammography is somewhat similar uh, in the number of people needed to treat. Uh, one of the one of the questions that have been raised about this is, you know, there's uh, again a thousand cancers here out of fourteen thousand or seventeen thousand. So what about those other tens of thousands of nodules they found? Those were all worked up. Uh, evaluated and not found to be cancers, but you know there are this ratio of nodules that didn't mean anything, and there are nodules that were cancerous. Uh, complications are very low, uh, and also the question is that needs that's ongoing workup is you know we're giving patients this radiation, are there bad outcomes related to that? So we're always trying to find the lowest radiation uh, possible. And that's a standard of practice in the radiology field. So again, going back to this Fleischner criteria, you remember this was about, you know, like, hey, how do we work up these nodules? Well, uh, since this uh, lung cancer screening came out, they invented their own. It was an offshoot of the Fleischner criteria. Uh, it's called the lung rads. Uh, again, if they find nodules uh, in these, people are already high risk because we're doing these. If we find these nodules, what do we do with them? And interestingly, what's the risk of malignancy? So if they find these cancer, these nodules rather, sorry, if they find these nodules smaller, the likelihood of them being cancerous is very, very low. If they're larger, then the risk gets higher. Okay. So how does this relate to you, right? So, I mean, we're talking a lot about uh, smokers and imaging and PET scans and nodules, you know, it's uh, important to think uh, through your own personal choices in healthcare, and I'm just going to go through some of these good, good thought-provoking questions. I didn't come up with them, that's why I'm calling them good. Uh, about your own uh, decision making around smoking and what you would want to do about this uh, information. Uh, since the Lodo CT uh, study came out, the United States Preventative Task Force. Uh, who kind of guides suggestions to Medicare on what to, on how to study people, uh, came up with an increase in who should be studied, and that's currently going through insurance approvals and that sort of thing. So one of the questions you should ask yourself is, you know, do I qualify for this study, or I'm sorry, for to be screened? And so are you between the ages of 55 and 80? Uh, do you smoke or have you quit within the last 15 years? And instead of that 30-pack year, do you remember that? We're now we're talking about 20-pack year smokers. So why the change? Um, well, they found out over time that women and people of color 
develop cancers after smoking less than 30 pack years. And so we are trying to capture as many people as we can with early stage cancers, and that's why we've adopted this new model and made the recommendation. Uh, the, the fourth question is, are you healthy enough to get treatment? So those are all important questions to think about. Along with that, you know, again, these are personal questions. So on the face of it, that may seem obvious to you and others, it may not. You know, it might be obvious in different ways, but do I want to know if I have lung cancer? You know, what do I think about these pulmonary nodules and understanding that I might not have cancer but need rather follow up? Um, and, you know, I would, I would add to that, you know, eventually, if you ever get a CAT scan, you know, they may find these nodules and, you know, down the road and they may be scanning you almost regardlessly. They may recommend these sorts of scans. And, you know, down the road again, if you, you know, they said, oh, we've, you know, you go to the emergency department and you find a nodule and you're like, well, wait, I've, I've had these nodules for two or three years. We followed them. They're negative. That causes less stress and less burden when you're older and have to make these decisions again. So knowing is half the battle a lot in medicine. And I think, you know, the question is, you know, what do you think about having nodules? Uh, I, I think it, it might be important to consider that you know, following through with those so you have some peace of mind about them is, is, a, is, a, good, is a good consideration to, uh, to think about. Um, and then, uh, you know, as you go on, you know, would you want to be treated for cancer? Would you want to be screened every year? Uh, do you have questions about radiation exposure? Uh, are there other things you can do to prevent lung cancer uh, or catch it early? Uh, where also, where can I go for lung cancer screening? There are three hospitals in the St. Luke's uh, world that have low-dose CT sites. There's St. Luke's, there's the Laurentian Medical Clinic up in Mountain Iron, uh, and Lakeview Hospital in Two Harbors. Uh, and then uh, one of my favorite things to talk to people about is smoking cessation. Um, you know, smoking is a... Is a it's kind of a, what a person carries around, you know, with, with smokers, it kind of feels like a shame. You know, they, they're embarrassed about it. Uh, I hear you. I, I, I understand what you're talking about. Uh, this is an addiction. It is hard to, uh, you know, some people feel kind of shameful about because they understand how, how bad it is for them, but they still do it. Uh, you know, but this is this is an addiction. This is what is, you know, driving you to do these decisions that you know are bad for you. Um, and so, you know, finding support, finding reasons to quit, picking a quit date, identifying the things that cause you to keep smoking. You know, like I always smoke when I read the Sunday paper or when I go for a drive, you know, finding those things and, and kind of understanding how smoking has just become part of the fabric of who you are and what you do every day, that those are the ways to kind of pull yourself away from the habit of just smoking. You know, it's, it's kind of mindless sometimes too, right? But then again, there's times where, where you need it to, to when you're feeling good and you need it when you're feeling bad. And, you know, there's, there's all the reasons under the sun to smoke. And the sooner you kind of find those in yourself, then the better you are able and better equipped you are to quit. So getting support from friends, family, and healthcare, uh, recognizing the symptoms. People describe it as sort of the tsunami of, you know, emotion and time slowing down and sort of like a pain and understanding that those symptoms go away. You know, they become less and less intense and people talk about how they will always have some lingering wish to smoke, but the further away they are from it, the better they are able to adapt away from the choice of smoking. So, Always reinforce the positive efforts that you're doing with smoking cessation. Remain a former smoker. You know, even if you fall off the wagon and you have a cigarette, every now and then you're still a former smoker. You know, you've kind of changed your mind on how you're going about this smoking cessation. Um, you know, and the years of kind of stress about smoking, now that you're working on quitting smoking, that's a good thing. You know, you should be rewarding yourself for making that positive change in your life especially with understanding all the things we've been talking about. Um, there is support out there. 1-800-QUIT-NOW, I think, started uh, out of the um, tobacco settlements years ago. This is a free service. Uh, I've been having patients tell me lately that sometimes they don't get any information from them if your insurance 
if if your insurance pays for smoking cessation, so you may want to talk with your insurance company also about what's covered. Uh, but 1-800-QUIT-NOW provides free patches, gums, and lozenges to help you quit smoking, to help talk you down if you're having an urge, that kind of thing. Other medications that can be prescribed would be uh, nasal sprays, um, inhalers, uh, Chantix and Zyban are uh, prescription medications that you can take. Uh, again, those uh, need to be discussed with your doctor. Uh, risks and benefits are always important. Um, different people, again, have different benefits, uh, and it's up to everybody to kind of find their own way. Even going cold turkey can can be successful. Uh, so there is just one quick graph I wanted to show you. Uh, I appreciate your patience, and uh, we're almost through all this. Uh, this is a graph going from 1900 over to 2010. This is about cigarette sales and lung cancer deaths in the United States over the 110 years. So over here in the purple, this is the cigarettes sold per adult per day. So at one point, the peak in the 1960s shows that per adult in the United States, every adult in the United States, they sold enough cigarettes that every adult would smoke 11 cigarettes a day. That's half a pack of cigarettes for every adult in the United States every day. As is, it's astounding. So this has gone through the Great Depression, the Second World War, and then finally in 64, the Surgeon General reports, hey, smoking might not be as good for you as you think. Then popular culture got on board too, started banning cigarette ads on the radio and TV, and lo and behold, things start to drop. Then we start adding taxes to it, secondhand smoke, in uh, banning smoking in flights and in restaurants in California. Uh, our smoking numbers have dropped, and now, uh, 11 years ago, it's down to three cigarettes per adult per day are sold. Uh, and this is the matching mortality or how many men, this is specifically men, uh, have died uh, accordingly. So there's this nice, I mean, nice meaning it seems pretty evident that there's a, a lag time of about 20 years between these two events that shows, you know, when you quit smoking, when a population quits smoking, then the likelihood of dying also goes nicely along with it. So there is hope out there if you are, you know, seeing less and less smokers, that means less and less people are dying from lung cancer. So just a quick review, uh, more deaths from lung cancer than breast, prostate, and colorectal cancers combined. Uh, 154 deaths in the U.S. That might be different than what I wrote up there. Uh, again, uh, symptoms uh, are very rarely present until the lung cancer has uh, advanced. Uh, again, the non-specific symptoms, they aren't uh, slam dunks that this is lung cancer, but these are things to, again, talk with your doctor about. Uh, the workups involve CAT scans, PET scans, MRIs, biopsies, treatments, and then ongoing follow-up. Uh, again, should you be screened, again, between the ages of 50 and 80, uh, have you quit smoking or are you still a smoker? Uh, have you smoked the equivalent of 20 pack years? Uh, are you healthy enough to get treatment? Uh, talk to your doctor about uh, your smoking cessation goals to help you make uh, successful decisions. Uh, I'm thankful for your time. Uh, that's all I have, and I, if we have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. See how we can do that. Now I'm becoming more advanced in my Zoom here. Thank you, Dr. Abley, very much for your time. Um, and we do have a few questions. Uh, one person wanted to know what uh, the next step would be. Uh, can they get, if they qualify for a low-dose CT scan, can they have that ordered by their primary care physician, or do they need a referral? Uh, that that seems like a question that it was almost uh, uh, written ahead of time. That's a great question. Um, your primary care doctor can certainly order a low dose CT. Uh, in fact, at the end of my talk, there will be some questionnaires out there that will help identify whether you qualify or not for a CT scan. And then someone from St. Luke's will actually reach out to you to find out, you know, and talk to you about setting up that low dose CT. So perfect question, thank you. And then we have another question that's a two-parter. 
This person wants to know about secondhand smoke. Um, are there uh, stipulations for um, how and if they qualify for a low dose CT scan and if the exposure was when they were young versus uh, an older adult? Uh, that's a, a good question. Uh, the low dose screening, it does not apply specifically to uh, secondhand smokers. This is primarily for, this is only for 30 pack year smokers, the higher risk people. Um, the risk of secondhand smoke becoming cancerous is greater uh, given how much secondhand smoke you're exposed to uh, over time. So if your exposure to secondhand smoke has decreased over time, then there's less and less likelihood that that is currently you know, putting you at a higher risk of cancer, similar to quitting smoking. The sooner you avoid it, your risk reduction, uh, you... Are you know? Let me let me say this the right way. Uh, the risks of you developing cancer become less and less the further away you are from secondhand smoke exposure. Thank you. Uh, so the last question was about a device called a carrot. Uh, whether or not you've heard of it, and if you have, if you recommend it, it's used uh, to measure the CO2 in the breath that a, that a smoker exhales as a way to reward them if they you know reduce their smoking. Uh, no, I've not heard of a carrot. Um, I'm not too sure about them, so I don't have any uh, strong opinion about them, uh, but the, the physiology about CO2 retention uh, might be a little uh, complicated for me to kind of walk through uh, to give a solid answer. I really don't have anything to say about it, um, but I... I'm not sure if that's been FDA approved. That's an important piece of information uh, about uh, whether how effective that would be. I'm all for finding rewards to quitting smoking. Um, simple things like uh, clothes smelling fresher, breath smelling fresher, uh, having more energy, coughing less, breathing easier. Those are all very good signs. Um, so. Those are important rewards, too. Uh, again, I don't have anything to say about this carrot device. It's an interesting concept. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Adley, for your time and your expertise and for taking the time to answer our questions. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot for being here. We're thankful. And thank you to all of our listeners, and have a great night.